Hello and welcome back to Warspets Tactics, where today we have a very special guest. Hello there, my name is Bricky. Thank you so much for having me on Auspex. And today we're going to be talking about all of the main core army rules and our thoughts on them in the new 10th edition of Warhammer 40k. Hello and welcome back to Warspets Tactics, where today we're talking through every single faction's rules in Warhammer 40k. Now we've had every single faction focus article out from Games Workshop's previews, we can actually start putting them in context a little bit, and maybe get a little bit of perspective as to how they fit in with the game overall. For this very special collab video, I'm joined with the excellent Bricky, who I'm sure a lot of you have been watching his faction focuses over on his channel, and I thought it would be really good fun to get two different people's ideas on each of the faction focuses, and how the core army rules are going to impact their forces going forward. In this one, we're literally going to focus on the core army rule and the main detachment rule for each army, going through each of them, talking through what they do, and roughly how we'd rate them both for fun factor and how much impact they might have in game. The scoring system is going to be two part, both of them the fun factor as well as the in-game power will be rated on a scale of one to five, one being the worst or possibly the weakest, and five being the strongest and the most fluffy. Of course, we don't know the full picture quite yet. The points costs are not out and we don't know every single data sheet that the army has. So the power level of these army-wide rules and attachments could have a little bit of leeway. But overall, it's still fun to theorize how they perform in game. And of course, how they are fluffy wise and how they attach to the army themselves is an interesting thing to rate. And Auspex will be starting us off first with the main boys in blue, the Codex Space Marines. Thanks very much, Bricky. So kicking off here, we have the Space Marines with their Oath of Moment Army Rule and their Combat Doctrines Detachment Rule for the Gladius Task Force. The Oath of Moment gives them spectacular rerolls against one target, and Combat Doctrines generally gives them movement buffs, particularly being able to do a bit more damage after advancing. For these ones, I've chosen to rate them a 3 for Law and Fluff. I feel like it is going to give you the idea of a fast-moving strike force really punishing one key target. That does feel very Space Marine. I think for in-game power, I'll give it a 4. I feel like that Oath of Moment rule is just spectacularly powerful at downing one powerful enemy unit, but it's definitely going to be something that isn't too strong in every game. If you're playing against an army with a bunch of multiple small units, it just won't come into effect all that much. I'd also rate the Space Marines as a 3 out of 5 for fluff and fun factor. For the most part, I like to prioritize player choice, and it does have a good amount of player choice, but it is a rather simplified version. And while it is good at representing the Space Marine's ability to fight basically any target, it doesn't necessarily scream Space Marine to me. As for a power point of view, I'd also put it as a three out of five, a little bit lower, only because I think it is heavily army dependent. A Horde army will be affected a lot less by this rule overall. And if your opponent is good in the movement phase, a lot of key targets that might want to get hit by Oaths of Moment may not even be there to be attacked. As for the Tyranids, their army-wide rule is split into two things, Synapse and Shadow in the Warp, with their detachment being their hyper-adaptations. This represents them being controlled by a major hive mind, making it harder for them to be battle-shocked and being able to battle-shock the entire enemy army once per game. As far as flavor and fun factor goes, I'd probably give these a 4 out of 5. They've combined all three major aspects of Tyranids, a very powerful psychic presence, an all-consuming hive mind, and their ability to adapt to any enemy. I'd score them a 3 out of 5 as well for game potency. While we're seeing Battle Shock in lots of places, making Synapse quite useful, the Shadow in the Warp is simply a once per game use ability. And while it can swing the game pretty heavily, there is a good chance your opponent rolls well and nothing ends up happening. For my part, I think I'd agree with Bricky on those ratings. I've also put down the Tyranids as a 4 out of 5 for lore and a 3 out of 5 for power. I do think the return of the adaptive Tyranid traits will be really welcomed by players. That seemed to be one of the things that they missed the most when that got briefly taken away throughout 9th edition. And it does seem like a good solid rule that should come up in a fair few games. Might just be a little bit less effective against armies that are more mixed and you don't have everything of one target. And I feel like Shadow in the Warp, while it's really quite spooky, is just a one turn thing and you can't really guarantee that any one unit is going to fail the battle shock. Again, it seems like one of those ones that's useful but probably not overpowered. Next up, we've got the followers of the Dark Gods. I must admit, I really did like the look and feel of the Dark Pack special rule, the one where you cut your health slightly to get either lethal hits or sustained hits out of your damage. Basically, if you fail a leadership test, then your squad takes D3 mortal wounds. Chaos isn't without its risks. At time of recording, we're still waiting on the detachment rule for the Chaos Space Marines, 
But for the army rule alone, I put it down for a 4-4 four, four fluff factor. I do really quite like the actual idea of your units making packs with the dark gods for extra abilities. So I've put it down for a 2 for in-game effects. I think the buffs are quite good. It will be worth using quite a lot of the time. But taking the risk of mortal wound damage does actually take the edge off it a little bit. There are going to be times where you take more mortal wounds than you actually did damage out of the boost. I'm very much in agreement. I find the fluff factor to be excellent, and I actually give it a 5 out of 5. There are very few things more chaos than harming yourself and possibly risking death of your own squad mates just to kill something a little bit faster. As far as usability goes, I'd give it a 3 out of 5. The fact that you can use it in both the fight and shooting phase, and every single time you do either, makes it very potent when you need it, but also I could find yourself really just killing half your army over time without even realizing it. Still, it can be extremely useful for certain targets that need certain buffs against them. Next up are the Reawakening Undead Legions of the Necrons. Their main army-wide rule is a combination of the current Living Metal and Reanimation protocols, all together under the name of the latter, and allowing you to regenerate both models and wounds across your entire army. The Detachment rule also allows for your units to get a little bit better whenever a character is centered, really bringing together that Necron Noble fluff. As far as fluff goes, I'd probably give it a 4 out of 5. Necrons constantly coming back from the dead and also re-knitting their damaged bodies is extremely flavorful, and also being led by nobles is also a major part of their lore, even if it is a little bit of a boring rule. As far as gameplay goes, it's very difficult to tell. The lower lethality of 10th, depending on how much less lethal it is, will really go and show how good this rule will be. But I'm optimistic, and I'm going to go ahead and give it a 3 out of 5 just to be safe. That all sounds pretty reasonable to me. I've chosen to be quite similar and rank the Necrons a 4 out of 5 for the fluff. I really quite like the way that the reanimation protocols actually restores models to the board now, as opposed to just functions as an extra save when your unit's shot or attacked. I think it's just a bit more evocative when you're setting up models that were previously slain. I've chosen to be a little bit more pessimistic than Bricky on the rules perspective. I rank them a 2 out of 5 for that. Though I do agree it's going to be a massive deal whether or not enemies manage to wipe out entire enemy units or not. Against a good player who's really good at focusing all the fire and just whittling down one unit a turn, there's at least a reasonable chance that the rule doesn't come off all that often. But on times where it does, it could be absolutely massive, particularly happening on the command phase and maybe getting some models on objectives. I'd agree the command protocol seems okay. Looks like characters are going to be massively incentivized in the launch detachment. Moving on, we've got the hard bitten forces of the Astra Militarum. Their army rule is the reincarnation of their orders, this time generalised so you can apply them both to infantry and vehicles equally. I feel like the new order table is pretty solid, no real duds in the entire table there. Bonuses to hit and wound are all very nice, extra movement is great if you need to get to an objective. I'd quite like the way that take cover doesn't just give you a cover save, it just flat out improves the save of your models. We don't yet have the full text for the guard detachment rule, but broadly it's going to be lethal hits if you remain stationary for your ranged guns, it's definitely going to be less effective than the current born soldiers if you have to stay still to activate it, but still it should help gunlight elements punch up against tough stuff. For flavour I've chosen to give the guard rules a 4 out of 5, still quite cool to have your command structure issuing orders to the rest of the troops, and for in-game power I've chosen to give it a 3. Looks like it's still going to be very impactful and probably essential to the army being efficient, but maybe feels just a little bit of a calm down both in terms of orders and born soldiers compared with the previous perhaps. I'm in pretty close agreement, however, I would actually switch the numbers myself. A 3 out of 5 from the overall fluff and fun factor. Giving out orders is not necessarily slang exclusive to the guard, even though it is very popular in their command structure. As far as the power though, I would give it a 4 out of 5. I think the fact that it can be issued as a broad table into most to all units, depending on which officer you're using, is quite powerful and offers a astounding amount of flexibility for exactly what you need. Knowing you can swap an objective with duty and honor, or move on to one with move, 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 or increase the power of the attacks from so many others seems like it just can be really strong in the hands of the right general. Moving on to the temporal, corporeal forms of the warp itself, we have the Chaos Demons. The Demon's Army rule being Shadow of Chaos gives you benefits and negatives to your opponent depending on what part of the board is currently under siege by the demonic forces of reality and unreality. And also their detachment rule, Warp Rifts, allows them to come out of Deep Strike significantly closer at only 6 inches away as opposed to 9, so long as they are in their army's special Shadow of Chaos. As far as fluff goes, I give this one a 4 out of 5. I think it is extremely fluffy as demons only exist when there is a rift in reality. 
and that rift slowly spreading, making them more powerful and your opponent less powerful is extremely close to how the lore operates. And as far as power, I would give it a three out of five. While we do know some data sheets will have rules involving the Shadow of Chaos, the actual power mainly comes from Battleshock tests. And Battleshock tests in their own right are not only a dice roll, but can be heavily managed and mitigated depending on what faction you are fighting. It seems I've chosen to be a little bit more pessimistic on the demons than Bricky here. I've chosen to rank them a 3 out of 5 for the lore and fluff. I do quite like the way that controlling more of the board puts more of your Shadow of Chaos, and then that's more of your Dominion for where your demons can manifest. Though I just feel maybe it's just implemented in a slightly clunky way. It's going to be really quite dependent on the mission and which objectives you can reach. I've gone for a 3 out of 5 for that one. Though I've chosen to rank the rule a 2 out of 5 for in-game impact. I think at least in some games you might struggle to push out the Shadow all the way into the midfield and no man's land, particularly for the Warp Wrist ability which happens before your movement phase so you don't get the chance to move on to the objectives before your reinforcements come in. And even if you do manage to get it off, I feel like Demonic Terror and the Demonic Manifestation are only kind of small benefits at best. Maybe I'm being a little bit down on it, but feels like a rule that isn't going to be where the strength of the Demon Army mainly comes from. Moving on to the Nuns with Guns, next up we come to the Adeptus of Roritus and the reincarnation of their Acts of Faith, Miracle Dice, and also boosts when their units take casualties. The Miracle Dice mechanic has been such a strong one in 8th and 9th edition, substituting in guaranteed rolls whenever your army most needs it, massive 6 damage results, long charges, and passing key saves when you need them the most. In addition, the Blood of the Martyrs detachment also gives you damage boosts when your squads take casualties. I'd say that's probably less impactful than the Miracle Dice by quite a long way, but a nice to have that will trigger every so often. For ranking them, I've chosen to give it a 4 out of 5 for lore. I feel like it's really quite nice and evocative to just literally have the Divine Hand of the Emperor reach down and pluck a good result out of a sea of bad ones. And for in-game ability, I've chosen to rank it a 5 out of 5. It's a pretty spectacularly powerful mechanic in 9th edition, and it looks like it's only got stronger going into 10th, with very easy ways to generate and multiply Miracle Dice with the standard Sister of Battle Squad. Now I must say, I may be biased a little bit, but I simply don't care. 5 out of 5 fluff, 5 out of 5 rules, it is all for me. Miracle Dice are an excellent representation of Sisters on the battlefield, through their belief power alone being able to make the impossible happen and the adjustments to allow you to gain miracle dice when a unit is destroyed army wide now instead of just with the RMR lady buffs I think is a welcome change and solidifies their martyrdom style. The acts of faith have also been buffed and tweaked in certain ways allowing you to use multiple acts of faith per phase just only one per unit and also removing the ability to use two on a charge or battle shock test. As far as I'm concerned, this makes this a bit more fair and also allows you to really go as far as the dice you have. The Blood of the Martyrs also sounds incredibly fun. The concept of Celestine losing her two bodyguards and then immediately turning onto the turbo boost is lovely. And some of the larger characters like the Triumph of St. Catherine and Morvan Vol, when they are reduced to half their wounds could become quite frightening when fighting anything in melee. Moving on to an army that has had a short runabout, we have the Leagues of Votan. The army rule Eye of the Ancestors is a reworked version of the Judgment Tokens, only going to two and providing pluses to hit as well as the wound roll as opposed to auto wounding. And the Detachment rule allows you to gain quite a large amount of CP depending on when you kill a marked target that starts with Judgment Tokens in the beginning of the game. As far as fluff goes, I would rate them a three out of five. Judgment tokens are a very common part of dwarves, creating their book of grudges and making sure they are settled. But there is a little bit lacking with the new identity the dwarves have, being a very mining and resource dedicated faction, and have nothing to represent that. As for in-game power, I'm going to rate it a 2 out of 5. There is a lot to be questioned, especially the change in the ballistic skill of the Votan overall. But while there most likely will be other ways to gain judgment tokens, the only ones we have seen so far is when one of your units has died. And compared to its current iteration, I just don't think it's going to be enough of a damage bonus to mitigate the loss of your own units. Seems that I've chosen to rate the Leagues of Botan exactly the same, giving them a 3 for fluff and a 2 for in-game abilities. I feel like for lore, I like the Eye of the Ancestors rule with the judgment tokens and grudging one hated enemy unit, but I'm maybe just a little bit less convinced on the ruthless efficiency one, just randomly labelling one model to get killed a lot easier at the start of the game, and a random CP boost if you do it, unless your opponent hides it or whatever. 
I would totally agree that for in-game abilities, it's very hard to judge the leagues of Votan rules at the moment. We don't know how many ways there are going to be to hand out judgment tokens for things like Carls or Stratagems. If they are super easy to come by, then I guess they'll be stronger. But otherwise, if you can't really get all that many, or if you only get just one on a target, then it's not going to be that big a deal. I feel like the hit roll is just giving them back what they had before, before you actually get to the plus one to wound, which feels like the good bit. For the World Eaters, I feel like they have perhaps one of the most surprising faction second rules out of any of these previews. Blessings of Corn is pretty much the casino of Corn. Roll your 8d6 and then pick up to two buffs off this table, all based on a fairly convoluted d6 system, having to pay for things with things like double sixes or triple fours or things like that. From a lot of people's initial impression of that, they were a bit concerned that they wouldn't be able to get the results that they wanted to, but it does work out that you're strongly odds on to get literally any result on the table that you want to, even before you have other chances to make rolls like Berserkers on objectives. We don't know their full detachment special rule yet, but from the free text it was hinted that it was some way of getting sticky objectives. There might be something else like what the Death Guard had. I must admit, compared with the very floppy Blood Tide rule that they had before, I feel like this doesn't really fit the theme of World Eaters all that well. I feel like it's a mechanic that might have been better with something like Zinch. While I think it's reasonable enough in game, and it's fun to be powering up your units with various levels of damage for sheer power in 40k, I have only chosen to give it a 1 out of 5 for fluff. Just feels a lot less direct and bloodthirsty than I would have expected. I did quite like the touch of rolling 3 sixes to resurrect Angron though, that's kind of fun, if a bit unlikely. For in-game power, I've chosen to rank it a 3 out of 5, I think it will come in handy, and I quite like the way that you can tailor it towards opponents. I am equally a bit pessimistic on the Blessings of Corn. I rank it a 2 out of 5 instead of a 1 out of 5, only because the concept of rolling dice with the devil just sounds rather enjoyable. Though I will admit, the overall Blood Tide system, I think, suited Corn a little bit more, even if there were situations where it wasn't as good, versus very elite armies like Custodians and Knights. As far as in-game power goes, I'd actually give it a 4 out of 5. I think some of the buffs are extremely powerful. The fact that you are guaranteed to get army-wide 2-inch move at minimum game-wide is very good, and even an army-wide 6-up feel no pain can be quite potent when getting hit by weapons with multi-damage. Though of course all you need is one really good roll, and next thing you know your entire army can advance and charge and get an additional 2 inches of move, which really, that alone might end up winning you the game. Next up is the Priesthood of Mars, the Adeptus Mechanicus. Their army rules combine the Doctrina Imperatives as well as the Rad Bombardment Attachments, allowing you to make yourself tankier and shoot better with stationary weapons that now have heavy, or end up making you hit much harder against the enemy moving forward. An early game smash with Mortal Wounds or Forcing Battleshock is also helpful, and it continues to do so throughout the game on the 2nd through 5th battle rounds in your opponent's deployment zone. As far as fluff goes, I'd give this about a 3 out of 5. The imperatives leave a little bit to be desired, even though switching back and forth is a very admech thing to swap their style of murder. But I must admit, immediately radiation bombarding your opponent at the start of the game is an extremely admech thing to do. However, as far as power goes, I would only give it a 2 out of 5. The specifics in the imperative feel a bit difficult to handle, forcing yourself to either have the opponent in their deployment zone or you be in yours. And at the first battle round, taking a large amount of battle shock isn't the most difficult thing, as scoring doesn't happen until battle round 2 anyway. For the admate rules, I've chosen to rank them a 3 out of 5 for lore and feel, and also a 3 for the in-game power as well. Interestingly though, for lore perspectives, I kind of liked the Doctrinas more than the Rad Bombardment. I quite like the idea of the Tech Priest programming their Clockwork Soldiers and sending them into battle. I feel like that does a fairly good job of keeping the old Doctrina special rules that we had, and you've got a fairly big and meaningful choice to make each turn, with both the Heavy and the Assault keywords being very good. The Rad Bombardment just felt a little bit more of a rule that I might have expected for Imperial Guard to me, though Crazy Radiation Bombardment is pretty fun. I'd say for in-game power, I certainly think that the Doctrine is a lot more powerful than the Rad Bombardment as well. Flat extra movement or damage all game long seems great, really works well with all the decent shooting units that Admech can bring to bear, and while the deployment zone stuff is a bit niche, I'd treat that more of a nice to have as an addition as opposed to a main benefit. For Eldar going into 10th edition, I felt that their faction focus was perhaps one of the most powerful that we saw just for the raw power of the rules themselves. Essentially they seem to have borrowed the system of Battle Miracle dice, starting with 12d6 worth of them at the start of the game, though having far less ways to regenerate them it would seem. Again, plugging them into key rolls like big damage rolls, decent charges, or saves when you need them, I think will be absolutely massive. 
I was kind of surprised to see that they'd also given them Unparalleled Foresight, which is basically the old Master Artisans, re-rolling one hit roll and one wound roll every single time you shoot or fight, basically a massive flat damage boost across the entire army, and if you start doing that on things like Bright Lance shots, it's going to be a bad time for enemy heavies and vehicles. I've chosen to rank them a 4 out of 5 for lore, I really quite like the idea of the Farseer casting the Strands of Fate, feels very much like casting the runes to me, I feel like the Unparalleled Foresight though just seems a bit arbitrary maybe. For in game of power though, this is definitely a 5 for me, I feel like this is going to be a big part of where the strength of the Eldar faction comes from, and if their data sheets aren't costed fairly high to represent this, I feel like they're going to do pretty well. While I will always be a little sad that the Eldar stole my beloved sister's rule, Strains of Fate is absolutely a very fluffy idea. Being able to scry the future for possible outcomes and swapping them to your favor is very, very Eldar, even if Unparalleled Foresight is in its own right just kind of a more weak, fluff-wise ability. That being said, I would also rank them a 4 out of 5 for fluff. Being able to not only scry the battlefield prior, but then adjust the futures you look at is very enjoyable and quite Eldar. However, for their in-game power, I would also agree 5 out of 5. Unparalleled Foresight is just a massive damage boost across the board and is quite surprising to see in a world where statistically rerolls have been reduced at a good margin. Moving on to something far slower and smellier, we have the Death Guard, Legions of the Plague God Nurgle, and the Primarch Mortarion. The army rule Nurgle's gift, allowing for an ever-expanding range of minus one toughness, as well as sticky objectives army-wide, represents the sickness and disease-spreading nature of the Death Guard's very existence. As far as fluff goes, I can go ahead and give this a 3 out of 5. While the Death Guard are known for being rather tanky, more so they're known for just creating pestilence where they stand, and I think Nurgle's gift, as well as the spread of sickness, do illustrate this well. However, even though we don't see all of the major effects of this army, I would be giving it a 1 out of 5 for in-game power. So many other armies can get spread the sickness through their basic troop option, and reducing the enemy's toughness by 1 sometimes won't even make a difference depending on who you're fighting. For Mortarians chosen, I must admit I am also a little bit on the pessimistic side about them. I do quite like Nurgle's gift and the way that it feels, expanding auras of plagues are quite nice, but I feel like their detachment rule is just kind of boring. I feel like just about anything, even something radically different to improve their durability, I feel like it would have kept with their theme a little bit more. Fully agree with Bricky that it's a fairly common ability throughout plenty of units in the game anyway. I would have to agree with the power of the rules here. Obviously Death Guard could still be very strong if their points and data sheets work out quite nicely, or if they get powerful stratagems and things, but I feel like the main power of the army just really isn't going to come from these two rules. With the stretched toughness charts, it's just not going to matter in vehicles quite as much as it used to. And with the way that Death Guard often like to play by stomping onto the objectives, I feel like sticky objectives is just a little bit less relevant for them. Next up we've got the Defenders of the Imperial Realm with the Imperial Knights Army. Their army special rule is the Code Chivalric. Picking one of two big oaths to do before the game, that gives you a buff that functions throughout the game, and then a quest to go on to try and gain three command points, though it is quite hard and a little bit dependent on your army doing well anyway. You either get some solid amount of extra damage from some re-rolls, or small boosts moving around the table with plus one to your move, advance and charge. For their detachment rule, they're sort of pinching a boosted version of the old Tyrannus rule. A six plus feel no pain against everything, mortal wounds included this time, and then if your army does happen to do your great deed, you go up to a five plus feel no pain, which is pretty massive. For lore, I've chosen to go for a three out of five for this one. I feel like their detachment rule is just a little bit boring being flat extra durability, but I do quite like the idea of swearing oaths and trying to achieve some great quests, that feels all very knightly and honourable. And for an in-game power perspective, I've gone for 4 out of 5 here. The durability boost is exactly what knights want, having a lot of units that are going to be out in the open. Tyrannus was a strong household before, and it's only got better. It's hard to argue with extra damage or movement as well. I think the honoured ability is a little bit unlikely to go off, but when it does, it'll be huge. The Code Chivalric is certainly looking like a very solid rule overall. Both buffs are very powerful depending on what flavor of knight you'd like to go with, and I thoroughly enjoy how the detachment rule itself is baked into succeeding in your quest. As far as lore goes, I'd also rate it a 3 out of 5. I think that knights embarking on their noble quest and also being rewarded for doing so is just a very fluffy and classic knight thing to have. 
And as far as power goes, I would go a full five out of five. Knights already are hitting on threes, so a reroll of ones to hit and wound as a buff is already quite substantial, especially when it is army wide. And a heavy increase in durability, plus CP being at a premium, completing your quest is basically a way for you to really become a problem in the later half of the game. Moving on, we have the new upstarts of the galaxy, the Tau Empire, and their quest to make sure everyone, whether they like it or not, embraces the greater good. Their army-wide rule of the exact same name allows the army to operate in pairs, giving one the ability to observe and the other to guide, allowing one of the two to increase their ballistic skill by one and possibly ignore cover with their attacks if the other unit has a marker light. Starting off, they also have the Kao Yun Detachment, giving sustained hits one from Battle Round 3 and onwards, and two if they are being guided. From a lore point of view, I give this about a three out of five. Tau lore is a little bit difficult to figure out exactly how you want to do it. However, Tau working in pairs and utilizing significantly better shooting by lazing targets is certainly a very Tau thing to do. However, it does lose a few points to me because of the Montcut detachment rule being only one half of the Tau's overall combat strategy. As far as in-game power goes, it's a little difficult to tell specifically with a lot of the other Tau data sheets, but I'd give it a four out of five from what we've seen. If you do this properly, half of your army will be hitting at a ballistic skill of plus one, and the amount of ignoring cover you could do if you stack up proper marker lights is very strong. Not to mention the amount of sustained hits you will be getting on from turn three onward. Seems that I've ranked the tower the exact same way, a three for lore and a four for in-game power. Lore-wise, I feel like it's pretty reasonable that as the shooting faction, their boss really do focus around that. I think I might have expected their tactical philosophies to be the faction rule rather than marker lights, but I guess I'll go with it. Fully agree that overlapping fields of fire and working in pairs does seem very Tau. For in-game power, they'll certainly have a fair bit of shooting bite in the early game, and that Kaoyon rule is absolutely monstrous later on. Sustained hits 2 is a pretty crazy damage buff, often going to be a plus 50% damage compared with normal. I feel like on their launch detachment, Tau players are going to want to play pretty cagey and then go big damage from turn 3 onwards. Kind of a shame that we don't have an option for Monkai yet though. So next up we have the Chaos Knights, aka Battleshock the Army. Their previous Harbingers of Dread table has been swept aside for a much more simple one. Minus one leadership in a 12 inch aura from Battle Round 1. And then from Battle Round 3 onwards you start to convert that into some actual genuine damage and defense. Battleshock targets are plus one to wound with your guns. And then if they try and attack you when they're Battleshocks, they're minus one to hit as well. The Traitorous Lance Detachment rule forged in terror, that very much doubles down on all this, meaning that you have to test Battleshock even if you've taken any casualties whatsoever, or even taken any wounds at all off a big multi-wound monster or something. Overall for flavour, I feel like it's decent enough. Scaring the enemy to death is one of the things that Chaos Knights are known for, seems like a reasonably solid rule to represent that. I've chosen to rank it a 3 out of 5. I think I might have just enjoyed something a little bit more Dark Mechanicus thrown in there maybe. It seems like at the moment at least we've lost any sort of Dark Mechanicum souping up your weapons for cutting health and things. I did quite enjoy the Infernal mechanics from the previous codex. For in-game effects I've also chosen to rank this a 3. Against certain armies it will be really big I suspect. Looks like they genuinely will be triggering battle shock on a whole load of enemy units as the game goes on. Could be disruptive for stratagems, objectives and falling back early on. So you do only start to convert it to genuine damage slightly later in the game, which might be a bit of a downside. Even when you do, I feel like it's maybe not quite as big or all-encompassing as a Tau's Kao Yon. It appears we have the exact same rankings here. I have a 3 out of 5 for lore and a 3 out of 5 for gameplay. Where Chaos Knights walk, fear tends to arrive, and for the most part, picking on the weak, much like my favorite Night Lords, is really their shtick. I do enjoy that the tables have been consolidated heavily in terms of the power of despair, doom, and darkness, though it is a little bit unfortunate that the more potent effect only arrives from Battle Round 3 and onward. Still, one could argue that your durability and the enemy's damage output can be reduced significantly if they are battle shocked, stopping them from using any kind of stratagem. And at the end of the day, it doesn't quite matter if you have all your knights alive, so long as the opponent has objective control zero, you'll be racking up points against them pretty significantly. Moving on, we have the Golden Legion of the 10,000, the Adeptus Custodians. Defenders of Terra and the Emperor marching out to the wider galaxy as things have gone a little awry since the fall of Cadia. Their army-wide rule is the Marshal Kata, allowing you to pick one of three stances at the start of the fight phase. 
and their shield host attachment rule is the Aegis of the Emperor, giving them a 4-up field of pain against mortal wounds. As far as lore goes, I'd give this a 2 out of 5. While it is true that the Custodians are very good in close combat and masters of many fighting styles, I think swapping between various karate stances just doesn't quite sell me on the Custodians' fluff. Also, their attachment rule being a 4-up field of pain against mortals while being very, very potent is just quite a boring rule overall. However, in terms of in-game power, I'd rank this a 4 out of 5. Being able to swap your stance not only in your fight phase, but the fight phase in general, allowing it to swap depending on what your opponent is doing, and a massive durability against mortal wounds, which is normally the Custodian's biggest problem, is no doubt quite effective. Seems I've been just a little bit more generous than Bricky on the lore for the Custodies. I do quite like the way of them adopting different martial fighting styles each fight phase. I've chosen to rank them a 3 out of 5 there. I would agree that the mortal wound thing, while it's quite nice to represent the Aegis of the Emperor, is maybe just a little bit changed in 10th edition. Previously that might have been primarily a defence against psychic attacks, and now a whole bunch of psychic attacks don't seem to do mortal wounds at all. In game though, I do think it's solidly strong. Most Custodies units, at least the Games Workshop ones, tend to be pretty melee focused, and I do quite like the way that you can pick one of three pretty powerful boosts right at the start of the fight phase, when you can actually see which units are in combat with what. Basically guarantees that you can always have the right tool for the job, and a little bit more melee damage than you'd have normally. I treat the Mortal Wounds as a bit more of a nice to have, I feel like they're going to be a little bit more random and coming out of small stratagems and things, as opposed to being dealt en masse in 10th. Next up we're on to the green skins, definitely a fun faction preview this one, everyone loves a whole load of hyper violent green skins charging into the fray. Their army wide rule is war, this one's been reinterpreted a little bit and you no longer have the choice of war or speed war, it's just a one turn boost now but a massively powerful one at that, advance and charge army wide, plus one strength and attacks so a huge combat boost there, and also a 5 plus inball save when your opponent strikes you back. That's going to be very relevant on the amount of orky units with low saves. At least a few of their basic boys got 5 plus armor now though. For their detachment rule, the war tribe gets stuck in. This one gives your orc units a sustained hits worn in melee. Basically flat extra damage there and you can't go too far wrong with it. Feels kind of goffs for a little bit of extra combat but not much else. Overall for fluff and flavor, I've chosen to rank the orcs a 5 out of 5. I think it's hard to do anything else when you can yell the word war and send your units in to beat up the enemy with some extra violence. I feel like it's really quite good for representing more mainstream orcs, though I think it will be quite fun when we actually get different detachment options, maybe representing things with a few more mech creations perhaps. For in-game power, I've given them a 4. I feel like both of the buffs are really quite nice. The sustained hits will just be extra melee all game long, and while the war is only one turn, it's still a massively powerful boost when it happens. Maybe the only issue is that it's declared at the start of the battle round. It does mean that your opponent will be able to see it coming and perhaps react accordingly if you go second. I would agree that the orc rules are very fluffy indeed. I wouldn't go as far as 5 out of 5, I'd probably stick with 4 out of 5, mainly because I think WA lacks a little bit of oomph on the more speed WA and shooty versions of the boys, and the attachment rule of get stuck in, while very flavorful in terms of its name, is just a bit boring as an overall concept. For power however, I would also go with a 4 out of 5, immediately slamming the big red button on your army and having all of them Advance and charge, increase their power, and get tankier is a massive ability, and the swing can be insane, especially when all the melee weapons that they have do indeed have sustained hits one. Overall, it seems quite fluffy and quite flavorful, which hopefully orcs will be happy with. Moving on from the color green, it's now time to talk about the color blue, with the Thousand Suns faction underneath the Zinchian God. They maintain the Cabal points in a different form from their 9th edition with the Cabal of Sorcerer's Rule, meaning for each non-Battleshocked Sorcerer on the battlefield you gain points that can be spent on all kinds of various abilities and powers, everything ranging from manipulation to flat out damage. And in the Kindred Sorcery Detachment Rule it allows you to adjust your psychic weapons to whatever you need per command phase. Overall from a lore perspective I'd probably give Thousand Suns a 3 out of 5. It's pretty enjoyable having this large cabal of psychers, and it's rather interesting the things they can do, but overall, nothing about it really screams to me hardcore zinch. That being said, I am more generous with their in-game output, and I would give them a 4 out of 5. 
certain abilities like Twist of Fate completely removing armor saving throws and the high power of the Doom Bolt Psychic Shot is really frightening and the ability to swap your stuff on the fly can be useful in the right situations. For the Thousand Sons, I feel like there was a fair bit of anxiety that Games Workshop were taking their psychic phase away, but it seems that Games Workshop responded to that by just giving them basically their psychic phase back, but sort of merged with their Cabal points. I feel like this mechanic seems pretty Thousand Sons to me, managing a whole load of points and spending them on certain psychic trickery. I do quite like the way that the buffs can manifest themselves basically across your army, and your opponent don't know where they're going to crop up. I feel like the detachment rule boosting their psychic powers is maybe just a little bit more on the underwhelming side. We've kind of yet to see just how much psychic shooting attacks they actually have. It looks like a lot of their damage might still be coming from Inferno Bolters and the like, which don't have a psychic keyword. Overall, I've given them a 4 out of 5 for lore. I do quite like the scheming resource management and it maybe being a slightly more complicated rule than some of the other factions perhaps. And for in-game power, I've also given it a 4. I feel like while they're one-off effects that are just going to apply scattergun throughout the army, you should have enough cabal points on the board to get off quite a lot of the most important ones, and I feel like none of them should really be underestimated. Twist of Fate and Doom Bolt are amazing for damage, but three stratagems and double moves are pretty massive as well, and even two CP for the single reroll seems big to me. If that saves a Terminator's life, then that's two cabal points well spent. Next up, we come to their sorceress rivals in the Silver Armoured Grey Knights, their rule I think was another bit of a surprise one for me, the Grey Knight army sort of blinks in and out of existence across the board these days, and then the detachment even doubles down on that even further, just really doubling down on the whole teleporting theme. The teleport assault rule allows you to basically just phase out a bunch of units at the end of your opponent's fight phase and redeploy them in your reinforcement step, quite useful for Grey Knights that are going to be a bit out of position perhaps, they're never going to be out of position for long and might be able to strike the opponent at completely unexpected angles. The detachment rule allows them to sort of advance and phase straight through things, they count as being able to fly and auto advance 6 inches, seems handy enough for getting to objectives, but unless they've got any major ways of advancing and then dealing damage, that doesn't seem to be quite as interesting. Maybe the interceptors will be able to do something good with that. For lore and feel, I've chosen to rank it a 2 out of 5, don't get me wrong, I do think it's quite a fun ability, almost like Imperial Demons warping across the board, but I feel like it's far from the only thing that Grey Knights are known for. They don't seem to have any massive intrinsic buff against demons or against psychers particularly. And while you don't really want to create an entire skew list, I feel like at least a nod to this might have been nice, or maybe realising Tides of the Warp as their army rule and the Teleport Assault as a detachment one. For in-game power, I've chosen to give it a 3 out of 5. I think it will be very useful, but maybe not something to base your entire tactics around. Some armies are just going to be able to screen out Deep Strike absolutely fine on their entire half of the table. A lot of the time it might just make sense for your units to hold positions, as they're going to need to stay on the board at least for some of them to hold objectives and things. I am actually quite a bit more optimistic on the Grey Knights overall. I gave their overall fluff a 3 out of 5. While it isn't the greatest thing uh, in terms of Grey Knights' power, like their psychic or their anti-demon nature, I do think it puts them in a very interesting niche that they represent in the lore. A whole bunch of hyper-elite, hyper-mobile, specialized units bumping around the board does seem rather enjoyable. Even if the teleport shunt rule is definitely a bit more situational, and depending on what the data sheets might give us. As far as in-game power, however, I went with a full 5 out of 5. I think that a good player is always defined by how well they utilize the movement phase and the ability to go with up to three units on the battlefield and bounce them around across the way, not only ignoring battle shock as you pull them at the end of the opponent's turn and bring them back at the end of your movement phase, but also just the ability to get multiple angles, lots of great shooting spots, and even though a nine inch charge is not, well, super statistical, three of them certainly is. Moving on, if we're feeling a little bit sadistic, the Jukari are coming out, bringing in their new army faction rule power from pain, utilizing pain tokens this time around instead of per battle round adjustments. Similar to the World Eater's Blood Tithe mechanic, you gain pain tokens at the start of the battle and every time a unit is destroyed or fails a battle shock test, and you can spend them to either reroll advance rolls, charge rolls, or rerolling all hits in the shooting or fight phase. The real space raid attachment allows you to gain an additional pain token as well for each of the main factions you have a leader for, the Archon, Succubus, and Homunculus. Overall, I give the lore of the Drukhari a 4 out of 5. Inflicting pain is entirely their shtick, and getting better from it is the second thing that is entirely their shtick.
Specifically, allowing the pain tokens to be used through the shooting, fight, movement, and charge phase allows you to spend them in very specific places where it is the most important. And overall, I would argue it is a significant buff that only gets better and better the more damage you do, which is very Drukari. As far as in-game power, I'd rate this a 3 out of 5. While the benefits are quite good, I think pain tokens might be at a premium. You don't start with a ton, and depending on who you're fighting, you might end up with less than you'd hope. Also, the real space raid attachment doesn't do a whole lot more besides just giving you a few more tokens, and it does not provide any buffs that consist throughout the rest of the game. I must admit, I do really quite like the Drukhari's ability. I think it's got a great feel to it, the way that you actually get points for either destroying units or making them fail battle shock, and then the Drukhari literally feed off the pain that they've created and plug it back into their army to cause yet more carnage. Maybe I just think that mechanics that depend on enemy kills are kind of cool, but I've chosen to give this one a 5 out of 5 myself. That is pretty much based on the empowered through pain rule though, as opposed to the detachment rule, which is a little bit on the boring side. For in-game power, I've chosen to be a little bit more generous, giving them 4 out of 5 for that. Again, I think it's going to be one of those abilities that's a lot better against certain armies than others, and it depends on whether you can get the pain train rolling or not, but just trading out one of these tokens for full unrestricted rerolls to hit, either shooting or fighting, is enormous amounts of extra damage. Sounds like you could be plugging that into Dark Lance Ravagers or Incubi with a whole bunch of fighting melee. Plus, it might be able to save you a command point here and there with charge rolls. Next up, we come to the many limbed uprising that is the Gene Stealer Cult. Again, definitely one of the armies that really surprised me with their new mechanic. Cult Ambush basically recycles your units, potentially all game long for battle line units, just literally replenishing their unit to the board after they've died. The way it works is that you roll a dice and it basically auto succeeds for battle line units as you add a 3 to it, but on a 4 plus that unit is placed off the board and you try and put a cult ambush marker somewhere vaguely safe from the enemy. Most of the time the opponent is then only going to have one movement phase to try and get within 9 inches of a cult ambush marker, try and scrub it from the board, but if they don't, each one that survives will allow you to basically respawn a whole unit. It comes back without any characters attached, but otherwise at full strength, potentially a whole horde of neophytes or acolytes back on the board. It does seem pretty monstrous, and there might well be other ways that you can manipulate it that we haven't seen yet. I feel like that acolyte icon ward might well do something else with cold ambush markers, maybe allowing you to deploy more or something. Otherwise, their detachment rule is they came from below. Units coming in from reinforcements get sustained hits worn and ignores cover, and that does sound like it has affects the cold ambush units, as the brawl lasts until your next fight phase, so it would still be your whole turn. Overall, for lore, I've chosen to rank this a 4 out of 5. Having the enemy army fend off an ongoing wave of cultists and mutants, which you don't know how many there's going to be coming, is really quite an evocative thing, I think. It's definitely going to make them a very spooky army to play against. I would say for reflecting their fluff, I did kind of like the older rules quite a lot as well. I guess I'd just be a little bit apprehensive if this is going to make them into just an endless horde faction, as opposed to more plucky and tricksy saboteurs. For the in-game power, I have chosen to rank this a 5 out of 5. I feel like it's a pretty interesting one and kind of hard to weigh up without the full rules and other data sheets. I think that that might make a big difference. And again, I feel like it's one of those mechanics that's going to be massively stronger against some armies than others. If you're playing against an army that's got a whole ton of really fast-moving flying units, they might be able to scrub off those cold ambushed markers and they might not come back that much. But if you're playing a slower-moving gun line of an army that doesn't want to get too close, you might just be able to bury them under a wave of bodies. The opponent's perhaps having to try and kill a unit two or three times within the course of the same game. Unless the cult units are costed really high to compensate, that seems almost insurmountable for some armies. I've actually been extremely wowed by the Gene Stealer Colt's cult ambush ability. I actually rank it a full 5 out of 5 in terms of fluff factor. There's just something so enjoyable about this ability not only respawning such a large amount of cultists coming out of the sewers and manholes of whatever hive city you're on, but also the fact that the only way to really stop it is to get units across the entire board and stomp out any holes they could come from. It really just feels like a genuine way to deal with gene stealers in the fluff. As for power, I am in agreement, five out of five, full stop. Allowing the main battle line units to come back every single time, so long as you place your ambush markers properly is huge. And I am a huge fan of anything that allows you to express player skill. Putting down the markers in the proper areas to where they will or will not be stamped out by the opponent and giving the opponent time to do so, I think is a huge benefit. It really has a way to prioritize player skill without feeling overly oppressive in some ways or, well, extremely oppressive in others. 
And lastly, we come to the non-Codex compliant chapters, all of the various Space Marine chapters that think the Codex Astartes is more of a suggestion than an actual set of guidelines. Through here, we have five ones previewed, the Dark Angels, Space Wolves, Blood Angels, Black Templars, and Death Watch. They all share the same Oaths of Moment ability that Space Marines do, but their attachments are specific, and we're going to be rating each of the attachments in terms of fun and power individually. For Dark Angels, I give the Grim Resolve a bit of a 2 for lore and a 3 for power. I think overall it is an extremely boring rule, even though it can be quite effective, keeping you from actually losing full objectives with Battleshock, especially considering how much Battleshock we've seen in 10th edition. For the Space Wolves, I'd give them a 4 out of 5 in terms of flavor and a 2 out of 5 in terms of in-game power. Having your characters complete major sagas and special deeds buffing your entire army is an extremely Space Wolf thing to do. However, based on the deeds they have to complete, I wonder if you'll be able to get any more than two and anything before Battle Round 3. For the Blood Angels, I am three out of five for both lore and strength. Having the Blood Angels be far more killy, increasing their strength and attacks is an absolutely classic Blood Angels thing, but it doesn't really represent them as a faction excessively. However, the damage it can do is no doubt quite potent and could be useful in many scenarios. For the Black Templars, I have them as a 3 out of 5 for lore and a 4 out of 5 for gameplay power. I believe that their lore could have been a bit more crusade having them go do very specific things, much like the Imperial Knights can. However, picking the certain thing as a vow is still very Black Templars. The 4 out of 5 for in-game power, though, is the sheer volume of their strength, depending on what army you're fighting and the flexibility in doing so. Being able to give your entire army a 6-up Feel No Pain, lethal hits on your melee weapons, or just absolutely abhorrent levels of anti-psychic power is nothing to be scoffed at. And finally, for Death Watch, I'm ranking them a 2 out of 5 for lore and a 3 out of 5 for gameplay. It's unfortunate that the Death Watch seem to not have anything very anti-Xenos for their main faction rule, much like how Great Knights don't have much in terms of anti-demon. And just giving them simple buffs like sustain hits, lethal hits, and precision feels almost identical to the Tyranid's ability. However, much like the Tyranid's ability, a 3 out of 5 for gameplay because despite their issues, being able to pick one of these every single battle round and have it active for the battle round at least three times a game can be very powerful and useful when you need it. For my part, I've been a bit less generous to the Dark Angels one. I must admit I find it a little bit boring. While they might be particularly steadfast, I feel like it's rare that you find a space marine that just abandons a fight anyway. I've chosen to give it a 1 for lore here, but a 2 for in-game ability. Every so often it will be a rule that gets you a few more victory points, as his squad still clings to an objective and holds it, when otherwise there would have been objective control 0. For the wolves, I'm in fairly similar agreement there. A 4 out of 5 for the fluffiness of the sagas. I really quite like the idea of the characters having their own quests to do certain things like slay enemy characters, enemy vehicles, or take certain points. I'm afraid I have given this one a 1 for in-game power though. I feel like it's a rule that looks a lot more powerful than it is. You do have the potential to be getting 4 different rules by the end of the game army-wide, but realistically all of these are very situational and they might not be entirely in your control. Your opponent also needs to put them in the position where they can be killed by your characters. I feel like you're never really going to get to the opponent's home field objective unless you basically already won. I guess killing a vehicle might happen if you have Bjorn with a last cannon there to finish one off, and killing enemy characters might happen but kind of late game. The Saga of the Bear is also entirely dependent on your opponent leaving a character alive and deciding to half kill one. For the Blood Angels, I think they're a lot more reliable. I feel like it's a pretty reasonable update of their red thirst. I've given it a 3 for lore for realising their chapter's danger and threat in combat, and I've also chosen to give it a 3 for in-game power as well. Hard to argue too much with just one extra attack all game long, that will really help out your melee units, but maybe isn't quite as flexible as say the Black Templar's option, where you get to tailor the damage buff depending on your opponents. Speaking of which, I've also rated the Black Templar's 3 for lore and 4 for in-game power, Swearing vows and purging witches is all very Black Templar and knightly, and I feel like maybe it gains just a little bit more than the Blood Angels as they can tailor it to their targets, being utterly lethal to things like psychers or vehicles with the getting army-wide lethal hits on their melee, or just going with stock sustained hits or even durability if that makes more sense. Finally, for the Death Watch, I think it's an okay rule. 
I'm afraid I have been a little bit less generous in giving it a 2 for law and 2 for power. You do get 3 good turns of decent enough buffs against your enemy army, but I feel like maybe it just falls behind some of the other rules a bit, as you can't double up on your favourite one. Say for example if you wanted lethal hits to try and take down some knights, you only get that for one turn, whereas the Black Templars can have that on their melee all game long. Still definitely not bad though, and you can use your favourite one of these in the turn that's going to be most impactful. I think it would have been fun to see some form of special issue ammunition come back though, but maybe that will be a stratagem. So far it would look like the 10th edition rules are looking pretty fluffy and flavorful in comparison to their 9th edition rules. I have certainly been enjoying seeing them, and I certainly have enjoyed taking the time to talk with you Auspex. Thank you so much for having me on your channel. Uh, for those of you viewers, if you would like to see my channel and various other content I do, you can find me at Bricky or Bricky Episode 2 being my second channel where we cover a lot more of the Warhammer content. And if you're looking for lore, the Adeptus Ridiculous podcast is where me and a few of my colleagues go over a foot-in-the-door style lore rundown for multiple kinds of factions, books, and so on. Yeah, massive thank you for coming onto the channel and taking the time out to go through all those with me. It's been really good fun to talk some 40k and get some alternative takes on all of these factions. Definitely recommend going to check out Bricky's channels, though I'm sure a whole ton of you are really well familiar with the Adeptus Ridiculous podcast already. It is very good. I'll hopefully look forward to visiting you over on your channel at some point in the future. Might be that we can do another collab video when we know a bit more of 10th. In any case though, let me know what you make of the faction rules that we've seen so far for Warhammer 40k 10th edition. How do you think that we did ranking them? And which bits do you like or dislike about them for your own army? So anyway, hope you've enjoyed a little bit of a different style video there. Feel free to subscribe to All Specs Tactics if you'd like to see more. I do tend to post the 40k videos just about every day. Finally, if you have been enjoying all the videos on the channel, I would just like to mention that All Specs Tactics does have a Patreon page as well, and you can find that linked in the video description below if you'd like to support and help keep these videos coming. Channel patrons do get a fair few advantages, seeing certain videos early, regular votes to see what sort of things come next on the channel, and automatic entry into the regular prize giveaways with a chance to win some big model kits each month. If any of that sounds good to you, or you'd just like to help support, the link is down in the video description. In any case, a massive thank you for listening, and I'll hope to see you guys next time.